Hi, this is Pastor Ken from Vineyard of Hope in Osawatomie, Kansas. My prayer for you today is that God would touch your heart in a real and tangible way for a breakthrough in your life as you hear this message. Thank you for watching, and I want to give you a personal invitation to come and see what we're all about. The church information is at the end of this video. Now I hope you enjoy this message. God bless. Oh, we praise you, we praise you, we praise you. I tell you what, let's try that again. I think that sounds like a reckless love. How about you? Let's give them a praise and a glory and an honor in this house like we're in love, like we mean it. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot that we get excited about in life, and there's a lot that we get, get to go through in life, and God pulls us through, and He does these crazy things where He kind of kind of fixes all the broken pieces, puts them back together, and, and makes something new out of a mess, right? And uh, we get excited about a lot of the things the world has to offer, and and um, I, I want to be in a place where we're so excited about who Jesus is in our life, what he's doing through our lives as a, as a beautiful body together, you know. I want to be so excited about the presence of God and worshiping God that like when you name him, you say Jesus, that every hair on the back of your neck stands up. You know what I mean? Like when somebody says Jesus, you get so excited that you actually say I know him rather than know of him. And so you start praising when I, I don't, you shouldn't be prompted to worship. If you get praise and worship right here, you're going to feel weird in heaven. Like it's going to be awkward for you. And I'm not saying, we all have our ways of doing it. Introverts, extroverts, we have our, but I want you to make it intimate. Can we do that? Can we do, I want you to do that, that reckless song that you guys had. It's a new song. And I know we don't have the words today. It's okay. But I don't think we're done worshiping before we go on. I don't care if you stand, I don't care if you sit, I don't care what you do for this song, but I want you to think of the lyrics, make them a personal prayer, an intimate connection with God, ready in your heart for the Word. Can we do that? I want your heart so ready for this Word, the Word of God, that it changes the way you, you live. You'll walk out different than you walked in. Did you know you can do that today? Yeah. I believe that with all my heart. I believe the Word of God can make you something different than what walked in this, this house today. I'm not saying that what walked in is horrible, but I'm saying everything that is meant to kill, steal, and destroy you, you can leave with confidence today knowing it's such a trick of the enemy that you have dominion over now, authority over now. You have power by the power of the Holy Spirit in you over these things now. And I want you to believe that today. Like, you didn't come to get religious. I can't stand religion. You came to connect with Jesus, right? Otherwise, you're doing it wrong. I'm just saying. You came to hear a word to challenge your life. A reckless love came, and it looked like that. It looked like a... a it, it, it was crazy. It was fanatical. It wasn't normal. He died on a cross, but he didn't just stay there. He rose again so that you and I could come today. And we could leave our hurts, and we could leave our habits, and we leave our hang-ups right here and leave different in Jesus' mighty name. Amen? Let's just worship him. Let's get our hearts ready before I go into this. And, and this is a new song, so I'm sorry if you don't know it, but shut your eyes. You can even shut your mouth. You can just... Think on the lyrics and make it part of your heart today, amen. For I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. What took a breath? You breathed your life in me You have been so, so kind to me Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of the God Pretty crazy love, who would agree? Amen. Reckless. Amen. A love that would leave the 99 just for me and you. I mean, that's pretty intimate. Better than that, it's extremely personal. And that's what it's about. Who would agree today? 
Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your love. I thank you that your mercy and your grace, we rest there. We camp there, God. We live there. This delayed judgment or grace that we live under, we thank you for it. We thank you that mercies are made new every day. But more than that, we thank you that there's freedom in Jesus Christ. That we can become new in Jesus Christ. That we don't have to continue to be hurt by habits, hang-ups, by, by life when it, when it hits us with some heavy stuff. We can find freedom in you. So I pray today in this intimate connection with you that your word would speak life. We believe this and we thank you for it in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen and amen. Goodness, goodness. Josh, you are excited about Jesus, ain't you? Yeah. <laughs> How many of you love the Lord today? Now let's try it again. God is doing a good thing. Yeah, she can stay up there because I'm not going to, I'm trying not to be long-winded. We got baptisms. But I'm excited about the Word of God and how it's resurrecting a lot of people from an old life to a new life because they're actually putting into work the power of the real living Word of God. They're, they're, they're activating it. The Bible says this. It says to not just be hearers of the gospel, but doers of the word. And a lot of times we think that we're going to come to church and we're going to hear a message and you're going to get your little cheerleading squad from a pastor who's going to energize you and that's going to sustain you for a week. Well, I'm sorry, that just doesn't work. I will never be able to give you enough said by my mouth that will ever change your life. There's nothing I will ever do that will ever do anything significant to move you forward until you actually activate the word of God by obedience to it. Did, did I say that too fast? <laughs> You got to take this stuff and run with it. You got to begin to activate it in your life and do it because God has something special for you. And I could say this, he has something beautiful for this church body. And, and I know it. I know that when he brought us here, this is, we're starting our eighth year, that he said that Osa Waterby would be known for his house. Now, it wasn't just talking about Vineyard of Hope. It was talking about a collective body of people. I don't care if it's the Baptist churches down the street, whom, by the way, it's been exciting to camp out with them. I'm doing a Bible study with two of the Baptist pastors. Why? We want to show unity is what matters here. Yeah. And we were told that this place would be known for his house. I believe that God is doing a thing in Osawatomi, a place that has been the devil's playground, used to mean freedom, used to mean new life, was a time when it used to mean so many good things. It has been perverted by the enemy. That's what he does. I believe God is bringing new life to that. It is cleaning up and God is doing a new thing and it's going to be okay. Amen? So we've got to decide, look at your neighbor, poke them so they're not sleeping, that we're going to make up our mind. Tell them, make up your mind. In this series that I'm doing right now, it's called Make Up Your Mind. Part one, two weeks ago, was very clear. I said that, that it, in making up our mind, we've got to understand that it's not natural to be a Christian. It's not normal to live faith. It's, if anybody said that you were going to, these guys that are selling you these books that call themselves pastors that say you're going to have your best life now, they're liars. I say that boldly because I'm telling you, Christianity is not about your best life now. It's about your surrendered life to the king now, living for him. And if you're doing it right, it's not always easy. You can live with blessings. You can be blessed. Don't get it twisted. But I'm telling you, when you begin to live your faith, more is expected as you grow into more of what he's called you to be. And then more is coming against you because you're finally doing what you're supposed to be doing. It doesn't get easier. You just get stronger. And so we've taught a horrible horrible thing in the church today that it's about the blessings and all the goodies of God. No, it's not. It's about living in freedom so somebody can see Jesus in you. Amen? So we've got to make up our mind that we're going to do things differently if we're going to be a spirit-empowered church. A spirit-driven. If we want to call ourselves Pentecostal, we better start knowing what Pentecost means. We've got to know what it means to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of the living God. We need to know what that means. Amen? So in the first part of this thing, it was called Not Natural. Part one, you can go on YouTube if you find it on our channel. You Watch part one, you'll catch up. But it was Make Up Your Mind Not Natural. I'll recap it real quick. I asked that, that, that for us, we need to understand, can we accept the fact that to most it may not look natural to love your enemies? It may not look natural to give your time to a church or to, to the Lord outside these walls. It may not look natural to give your money, your talents, and all the things that God has blessed you with for the purpose of somebody else expecting nothing in return. That doesn't look natural because the world today is a selfish world. And so when you live like Jesus, that is what makes you a lighthouse. That is what makes you the light in a dark place. And it doesn't look normal. If it was normal, everybody would do it. Could do it. But he chose us. The surrendered, the yielded, the broken, the weak. It's okay to be weak. 
He's looking for the weak person to do something beautiful through. It's in my weakness, the Bible says, that he's made known. It's just not okay to let the enemy beat you up with that weakness. We've got to begin to do something, make up our mind that we're going to live a supernatural life. It's not normal to love your enemies, give up your time, your money, your talents, and expect nothing in return. It's not normal to operate in the gifts of the Spirit, even if it means speaking in tongues, which we've made that all about the Pentecost. It's just speaking in tongues. That's one small part of it, okay? Let's look at the rest of it, okay? Give like you've never given before. Share like you've never shared before. Pray like you've never prayed before. Care like you go out and feed somebody. And if you're feeding somebody who doesn't have food, you're doing better than somebody that's just speaking in tongues doing nothing. I mean, I'm telling you, there's more to this if you're doing it right. And it's about a selfless act of love that looks like Jesus. It's not natural. Jesus was far from normal. I, 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 I suggested to us that, that that's why we call this a supernatural encounter when we meet God and begin to activate our faith. Living by faith is not normal, but faith is abnormal when it is truly exercised. To live in power and to see the Holy Spirit move among us. The challenge two weeks ago was to make up your mind to let God reprogram your hard drives. To begin to look like him and walk like him. It wasn't normal for Jesus to do what he did. And, and, to, and to get His model for us was crazy. He walked on water. I was trying to show you guys through the Bible that, that it wasn't normal for, for, for him to come, God in flesh, put on a skin suit, and it, there's nothing normal about being what Jesus has called us to be, but he gave us an example. He walked on water, he healed the sick, he touched the blind and they could see, he, 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 he loosened deaf ears and they could hear lepers, I mean he called the dead to life. Like, nothing about Jesus is normal. And when you're empowered by the Spirit, He says, listen, uh, these things that I do, I've got to go to the Father. And when I go and I sit at the hand of the Father, these things that I do and even greater things you're going to do, it's not playing with your mind. It's not a cat and mouse game. He's literally saying, empowered by my Spirit, I want you to be like me. And what you see that I've done walking on earth, you're going to do and even greater with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we need to understand the person of the Holy Spirit is the person that guides us and leads us. See, Jesus went and he advocates for us at the right hand of the Father. And now we have a spirit, the spirit of the living God, the person of who walks with us and talks with us. And it's not normal. It's not normal for me to walk up to somebody in Walmart because God puts on my heart to go to them and pray for them. But if I listen, something usually happens. I've never had anybody but one man in my life turn me down for prayer. And even he couldn't stop me from praying for him. I just couldn't do it there. It doesn't look normal, guys. This is what we had to get in our mind. Uh, spitting in mud and wiping it on somebody's eyes. They were healed. This is Jesus, right? I'm still recapping part one. It was nuts. Eating with the prostitutes and the sinners and the tax collectors. A rabbi wasn't supposed to do that in the time. But what did he say? That's my mission field. Those who are, I, I don't want, like I said, I don't want this to be a country club for believers. We have enough of those, they call themselves churches doing nothing, being, I want you empowered to get out of these walls and do something with your faith. Your families need it, your work environments need it. People need to see that the same Jesus that could take a meth addict and turn him into a pastor can take your grouchy butts and make you happy in Jesus' name. I did say it, didn't I? It's okay to be happy even when you're going through hell. That's what being a believer is all about. We're thanking him. It's not normal to thank him for the pain that you're going through. We do that as believers because we know that the pain is going to produce something beautiful on the other end if we'll just stand our ground. See, I've seen him do it before and I know he'll do it again. That's where my faith is. So I said, we got to make up our mind that it's not going to look normal. He spit in mud. He ate with prostitutes and thieves. Healed the sick. Casted out demons. Some of y'all, we got to cast out devils still. People that act like devils. None of y'all got kids like that, do you? Is it just me? I'm just saying. <laughs> ah! I believe that to most it looked wrong back in the day. To most, this day and age, to love somebody with a selfless love that expects nothing in return looks wrong because they've never experienced that. So it's not going to look normal. But we've got to make up our mind that who cares what the world around us thinks. We are going to be like Jesus. We're going to be baptized in spirit and power. He says that I come and I'm going I'm to send another one. He's going to baptize you with the spirit and power and fire. Amen. We need to know that if Jesus had it, we can have it. If he said to do it, then we can do it. If he was it, then we can be exactly what he said. That's what it means to be like Jesus. If I want to claim to be a Christian, then I better do some things Christ-like. 
It's impossible, church, to do both. Do you want to be prim and proper and powerless like so many other believers? Or do we want to be faithful, yielded, and powerful with our love life to impact people? You can't be both. You've got to make up your mind. You've got to make up your mind that the word is my last. It's my last. It's what I'm going to be. It's the final answer. Amen? And so part one, I, I simply said, we've got to make up our mind that it's not going to be normal. It is possible that, that people are going to look at us and they're going, to, they're going to mock us and they're going to call us names. But our evidence, the evidence of Jesus Christ and his power working through us will be enough to shut their mouths. I've seen it time in and time out. Amen? They can mock us, but I know that when you're spirit empowered, even their mocking you was expected when you know the word of God. He said, they're going to call you worse things than they called me. Have any of you read your Bible? Go to Matthew. He says, don't these things that they were calling me when I was walking on earth and I was like healing them? The very ones that I loved and I healed hung me, but I still, I, they, they called me really bad things. And Jesus says, but they're going to call you even worse. Because you don't look normal if you're doing this right. Amen. And that leads into part two. Part two is transformed to love. We've got to make up our mind that when God begins to do something and he begins to change our outlook, and we've got to make up our mind that when we're not living a natural thing, but really operating in faith, that God begins to transform our mind to love. And, and I, I want this to sink into some of your heads real quick because you've got to get this if you're going to get anything out at all today. We've been made to look like we're supposed to be weak when we walk in Christ. Like we're supposed to just tolerate a bunch of nonsense. No, you're not. You're supposed to boldly stand up and proclaim your faith. Right? And so you're empowered to love people with a, a solid no and, and also a heartwarming yes. Everybody likes a yes. They want the power but not the process. Right? When we've made up our mind to live by faith, true, abnormal, crazy, nutty faith, just like Jesus, then God begins to transform our minds. How is it possible to transform our mind into a mind made up to love even when it hurts? How many of you guys know it's not easy to love people who hurt you? As families, we're going to hurt each other some more. So if we don't get this next part into our heads, you're going to walk away disappointed, frustrated, offended, and you're going to forget that you weren't called here to like everybody, but you were commanded to love. I wrote this, and, and I really hope that it comes out right, because, man, God is good when he throws this stuff into my brain. I love it, right? How is it possible to transform your mind or my, our mind into a mind that's made up to love even when it hurts, even when we don't feel like? The first thing I think that you need to understand is love is not an emotion. Biblically, kingdom thinking, love is not an emotion. Where are you getting this, Pastor Ken? Let me show you. Love is a command. Like is a feeling. I, I don't have to like everybody, but I'm commanded to love you if I'm, if I'm a believer. I'm commanded to love you even if I don't like what you're doing. I'm commanded to love people even if I don't like how they're treating me. I'm commanded to love the world around me even if I don't like how they're treating people in my life. I don't care what anybody says. Love is a command when you're in kingdom thinking. When you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you are commanded to love. Matthew says this in chapter 22, verse 36. And this was a time where they were trying to trick Jesus. One of the religious people was trying to trick Jesus. And he says, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, you must love look at your neighbor and say I must he says he says teacher which is the most important commandment of the law of Moses in verse 37 Jesus replied you must love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind this is the first and greatest commandment you are commanded to love even when you don't feel like it verse 39 a second is equally important love your neighbor as yourself there's so many of us that don't love people right because we can't love us right still and I want you to know something. There's something quite freeing about looking in the mirror and going, oh, there you are. You're not a bad guy after all. When you can start loving yourself that way, you might love your family right. Instead of talking to them like you wouldn't your worst enemy, you might actually care for them in a way that's deep and true and Christ-like. Love is a command. And he says, so he says this, he says, and the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all it demands of the prophets, all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Love is a command. By learning this truth, we can begin to give thanks based on our faith, not our circumstances. <sighs> As Christians, our abnormal faith shines when we are in adversity. When adversity is punching us in the face. When I'm going through a divorce, if I can act like Jesus, the divorce will not make me fail, fall, and, and crumble. Because I believe that I can be Christ in skin even in the divorce. 
We have to learn that to love is a command and give thanks based on our faith, not our circumstances. Thanks based on the truth of, of the Word of God and not, not how we feel. Thanks on where we are. Th you know, when we thank God for where we are, what we have, and who He is now, we're not so worried about what we don't have. Right? And so when we begin to know that love is a command and we can do this and He's empowered us to do this, we begin to give thanks for where we are, what we have, thanks for who He is and what He's done. See, you feed your mind what can replace what has infiltrated your life through the many ups and downs, no matter what you're going through. Let's look at Jesus for a minute and see how He showed us that, that, that this example was for us to follow. Jesus gives us this example in Matthew chapter 15. You can turn there if you want. I believe that our minds are transformed to love by what we make a priority to think on. And Jesus gives us the prime example of what we should do. And I want you to hear this. He says this. It says, Jesus left and he went along the Sea of Galilee in verse 29. And then when he went up on the mountainside and sat down, great crowds came to him. Watch this. They were bringing their lame, their blind, their crippled, and the mute, and many others. And it says he... And they laid them at the feet of Jesus, and he healed them. He healed them. So first he healed them, and this is what followed. It says, the people were amazed. Why? Because something supernatural took place, right? First he heals them. Next they're amazed. And it says, when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, and the lame walking, and the blind seeing, it says, they praised the God of Israel. Or we could say, and then they praised God. They had to see it before they gave God praise for it. That's the human condition. Often we're waiting to get through the trial, to get through the hard thing. At the very end, we're praying God deliver me from this thing. And we forget that what we do in the journey will make or break our faith. Not the end, not the result. If you are ready for the yes or the no, then, then it's how you get through it that'll prepare you for the yes or no, right? What am I saying? I'm saying we've got to make up our mind that we're going to praise God before the outcome. Here, here's what happened. They praised God. They praised Jesus, the God. Uh, they praised the God of Jesus, the God of Israel, because they saw him do all these things, right? Notice it was after the mistake or after the miracle, I mean. In verse 32, it says, Jesus then calls his disciples to him and he says, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have had nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry. Or they may collapse on the way. So his disciples answered, Well, where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? Watch this. How many loaves do you have? Jesus says. He says, What do you got now? Jesus says, I'm going to show you something. After all these miracles, three days of doing all these great things, they acknowledge it, they saw it, they praise God after the miracle happened. He says, now let me show you something. What do you have now that we can use to feed these people? And Jesus asked that, and they said, seven, seven. We have seven loaves of bread and a few small fishes. In verse 35, it says, he, he, he told the crowd to sit on the ground. Jesus said, now sit down. And then he took the seven loaves of the fish. He took what they had, right? And it says, and when he had given thanks for what he had, it had not yet multiplied when Jesus gave thanks. No, not yet. He was thanking for the outcome before it even became something real. Before the miracle was tangible and in his face and real, before the seven baskets come uh, that were left over, he was thanking the Father in heaven for the miracle before it took place. That's faith. And, and this is what happened. It says he told the, uh, the crowd to sit on the ground and he took the seven loaves of fish. He took what he said they had, they put it in the hands of Jesus, and he broke them and he gave them to his disciples. And they in turn gave it to the people. Now I think it's neat that Jesus took what they had, he put it back in their hands after he broke it, and then it multiplied. Because they gave away what was put into their hands. So they gave Jesus what they had. Think about, think about this, this display of love and supernatural outcomes. They gave Jesus what they had. He said, use what you got now. They put it in the hands of Jesus. They believed with him. He broke it, put it in their hands, and they began to break it and give it away. You've got to give away what Jesus gives you if it's going to ever multiply. And that's what love looks like because love looks like something. It looks like thanking him before the miracle happens. And then when the miracle happens, I'm going to keep on giving so that I'm a constant conduit of love for people to see. A constant example of Christ-likeness that people can take from and they can run for, with and, and they can glean from to know what it looks like to be Jesus. That's what makes us a lighthouse. And so I want you to hear something. 
They all ate, it says, and were satisfied. After the disciples picked up the, the seven, there were seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. It says the number of those who ate, in this, in this there are two times in the Bible it talks about this, but in this case it says the, the, the number of those who ate was 4,000 men beside the women and children. They say about 12,000 were fed on this day from seven loaves and a few fish. I want you to know what God is trying to tell us here. We've got to begin to transform our mind to a people who will begin to praise him before the miracle happens because we know the God of the miracle is God whether it happens or not. He's still God even if the answer is no. He's God when it's yes. He's God while it hurts and he's God when it's healed. This means we've got to make up our mind that no matter what, we're going to continue to chase him. The process might not be easy, but the example of Christ's likeness that he's trying to create in us will be worth it for somebody that crosses paths with us one day. I'm telling you, God wants to use you to do something. And that's the love. You've got to make up your mind that you're going to allow him to transform your mind into a person who believes in the supernatural before it even comes into fruition. So you're going to believe and you're going to thank God for what he's going to do because his word says it. And until it comes into fruition or until he gives you an extremely big loud no, you're going to believe that he will until he does. Amen? That's what we do in faith and it doesn't look normal to believe. But it is faith. Sometimes we have to be broken before God will bless us. I think it's in that brokenness that he begins to bless. He broke the bread. He handed it to the disciples. They broke the bread and began to hand it out. And the miracle began to happen. A lot of breaking going on. Why? We're stubborn. I'm hard-headed. And I've learned the hard way sometimes because I've, I've not allowed him to have all of me. So what he does is he breaks my will so I'll live for him. Surrender to him. Some of y'all stubborn people, man. I know you are. That's not a bad thing. Just imagine that stubbornness for what God has called you to be rather than your selfishness. Turn it around and use it to show the enemy that that person that, that God is setting free, yeah, it's not the same. You're not going to run me down by my imperfections or by my weakness. I'm going to use my weakness to glorify God now. I'm going to shove it in your face because this is what God has done for me. Amen. Jesus was teaching us to follow his lead and in faith believe by thanking him even when we didn't have it. Thanking him in our lack. He asked, what do you have to think about that? We all ask, how many of you guys have heard people come to church and we just want more of God. Anybody? Come on. Pentecostals are really bad about this. They like have these songs, but more of you, God, less of me. And we're begging God for more of him. But, but like this, he's asking you to use what you got. I mean, the little bit of faith and the little bit of word that you have planted in your heart, if you're not using it for nothing, it's dormant, it's not with power, you've got to activate it and use the little God you got. And if you use the little bit that you got, just think what he'll do with all the leftovers. I mean, I can only imagine these people with these baskets. They collected these baskets and they're like, my goodness, we can send them home after the miracles with a lunch too. That's kind of cool. I mean, my mind goes crazy when I think about these things, but the principle behind this is Jesus is trying to show us, by example, thank me and the miracle will come. Thank me no matter what you're going through. Just believe that I am the way and the truth and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through me. But when you've come to me, there are good things that are going to happen. It may not always be easy, but I'm with you. I'll never leave you. I'll stick closer than a brother. You're not alone. See, that's the difference in faith and fear. I used to walk alone and I was subject to the very things that sought to kill and steal and destroy me. My, my addictions ruled me, but now I don't walk alone, so I rule the addiction by the power of the Holy Spirit. It works, church. Oh, man. I, I read this stuff and I think, if you can do it, Jesus, and you're telling me to do it, help me to use what little I have now so you can give me more. Maybe later, maybe now. Not for my glory, not for my gain, not so I can be seen. This is the thing. We want more of him so that we can do more for him. Amen? I wrote, God will, will make a way to multiply what you put in his hands by putting it back in your hands to see what you'll do with it. We lay the things at his feet, and when the miracle happens, we praise God. Well, Jesus gave thanks 
and then the miracle happens. Start learning to give by first giving. Giving thanks in all things and then the miracle will happen. Start learning to give by first giving thanks. Thanks for where we are, what we have, who he is, and what he's done. God's done some good things in this church. I've seen a lot of people where God has done some great things. If you begin to give him praise for all the things that he has done and who he is, God will then begin to transform your mind into the ability to have the ability to love where you are while you're in the waiting. You begin to love people. You begin to wait while you're moving forward and he'll begin to bless you. There's a, there's a scripture that I've, 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 I've shared a lot lately because it just it's ludicrous to the world to think that you can do this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 and 17 says, Rejoice always. Yeah. I can't do that. Don't you know what I'm going through? You're saying rejoice always? Don't you know what I'm... I had a heck of a week. H-E double matchsticks week. Some of y'all said hell of a week, right? It was bad. And you're telling me rejoice always? Yeah. You're not rejoicing because of the pain. Again, you're rejoicing because God is God in the pain. He says rejoice always. Pray continually. What? I don't want to pray. I want to whine. I mean, am I the only one? I know. Thank you very much. I want to tell everybody off in God, but it's not what he says to do. Why? Because it creates a mind of constant focus on what matters instead of what doesn't. If we will rejoice always and pray continually, and it says give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will to you through Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus did. Jesus did it so that we would follow, knowing that betrayal and death was coming. He wanted to show us how to live love out loud, despite the pain, despite what we're going through, despite what's coming. We praise him. We thank him because this is the example given. Matthew 26, it says, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread and then he had given thanks. When he had given thanks, he broke it. And what did he do? He gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body that's been broken for you. He was saying, coming around the corner, I'm going to go through some pain, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to thank God for it anyway. Join Join me in thanking God for the miracle, even if it hasn't happened yet. It was the example. Jesus is telling us in this church that we've got to make up our mind that we're going to begin to chase God and thank him, even if we're in the waiting instead of whining. Amen? I believe that he knew our ability to give thanks no matter what we face would unfold supernatural responses from God. In acknowledging God's word in our lives, we begin to learn how to give with the rest of our lives. We begin to give with the right attitude for the rest of our lives. What do you mean? Deuteronomy 15.10 says, Give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all of your works and in everything that you put your hands to. If we would begin to give thanks, I believe giving thanks leads to the ability to give love, to give hope, to give no matter what you're going through, to give of your resource, to give your talents. It's not always easy for Tyler to come and worship when he's had hell all week. But I guarantee you, because he knows that he is giving of his talents, and it's not always easy for people to tithe when they know that they are facing some major medical bills and everything else. But when they give of their resources, their time, they're doing it knowing that the same God that saved them is going to bring them through no matter what. If they're just stay faithful. Guys, I think faithfulness is a lost it's a lost thing in today's church. And, and we get mad because pastor says, come to church more often. No, I'm supposed to tell you come to church. I'm supposed to tell you give. I'm supposed to tell you care. I'm supposed to tell you feed the sick I'm, or feed the hungry I'm, and heal the sick. My job, don't get mad. Just try it. You might like it. Even if you don't feel like it. That's why feelings, that, that liking things, it's, it's okay not to like things and feel that way, but you're commanded to love. Give thanks. And giving thanks leads to the ability to love with your resources, with your talents. And you begin to generously do all that God has called you to do in love. God transforms your mind to love. And giving is the evidence of that transformation. I believe this with all my heart. Giving is evidence of love because love looks like something. I wrote this and I've said it to our church several times. Giving is not God's way of raising money. God is not in deficit. He doesn't need all your money. That's not what it's about. It's God's way of raising his children. I believe that we need to stop teaching people to give to get and teach them give to love. I believe that God doesn't bless just the act of giving. He blesses giving with the right heart according to his word. He says God loves a cheerful giver. So it's, it's about our mindset. 
God does not bless us just for the act. He blesses us for the right heart. I'm tired of hearing messages and people and preachers and people just promoting the blessings of God as our purpose for giving in our lives or giving of our lives and our money and our talents. See, when people give that way or they teach those horrible things like it's all about the blessings, if our motives to give are not love, when the blessings don't happen, we begin to resent God and more people walk away from church. So we, we should be teaching, you give to love. You give your time to love. You give your leadership abilities to love. You give your generosity, you give your resources, you give your talents because you love Jesus and you want to give back what so freely be given to you. Amen? Bottom line. So we've got to make up our mind that we're going to give thanks. That's the first kind of giving and everything. For where we are now, with what we have now, and that's going to become the mindset that carries us to give in every other way possible that God blesses us with. Giving is a way of growing. We grow in our faith when we give a little more sacrificially. Why? Because it costed something. You got a little skin in the game. I know a lot of people who will not do a study because you bought them a book. But if they went and bought their own book with their own money, guess what they do? Read the book. But they won't read it if you bought it for them because there's no skin in the game. It's a mindset that must be broken. And so I'm trying to tell you, part one, let's get out of ourselves and make up our mind that it's not going to look normal to live our faith. Part two, let's let God begin to transform our hearts and our minds to love. To love generously. To give when it just doesn't seem like it's normal. Because it never will feel normal. We are selfish by nature. Part three is going to be about getting rid of some of the outdated info. Part four of this series is going to be living a mind with a mind of royalty. And part five is the right attitude or the right, the right way of thinking. Amen. This whole series is designed to kind of get you out of you so that you can tap into the power of him. He that is in you. I want, to, I want you to know something. He loves you. And I don't know what you're going through or what you've gone through lately. But if you start praising God for everything he has done in the past, what you're going through right now, it's not going to be as difficult to get through. Why? Because your mind is on his faithfulness, not your misery. Your mind is on all he is rather than what you're going through. Make up your mind. And I'm telling you, God will do much, much better. Uh, again, again, we got to stop whining and start winning, I believe. And my winning is shown when I begin to praise him. I don't understand, God, why I'm going through this. Like, I've been sick four times, had to go through four different things of antibiotics, and I was blaming um, the devil and spiritual attacks and all this other stuff, right? This was last... Uh, every, all since last October and I'm like God why is the devil coming after me spiritually and I just whining and whining and whining and whining about the things I was going through health wise and then God said he said let me get your attention real quick Ken uh, I want to show you something okay okay you eat a lot of Twinkies you eat a lot of donuts you eat a lot of candy maybe the problem is you need to thank me that you're not worse off than you should be right now yeah y'all we, we trying to do the diet and the water aerobics now but what he was saying is <laughs> Hey, don't knock them water aerobics till you go with those old folks and try it. It's tough. I'm telling you. What he's trying to say, if you just thank him right where you're at, he'll show you where you need to be. And then you keep taking one step at a time to get there. God is not going to leave you abandoned in your pain or your misery, but he does want you to have the mindset to love him even when you're in it. And if you can do that, he'll grow your faith to do something new and something better the next time and the next, and the next, and the next. And you go from glory to glory and faith to faith. I don't know what you're facing, but I know he loves you. And he's going to use this storm. Remember, this is the one that calms it by one word. He just had to wake up from a nap, right? And he told the seas, calm, peace be still. I don't know what you're going through, but if you'll praise him for what you're going through, you'll probably see clearer the purpose of it later. I don't praise God whenever I'm going... Uh, at the end of my trial, I praise him through it. I really do. I'm like, these people be calling me names and hurting me and talking. And, and God, it doesn't feel good. But you know what? I don't care. You're going to do something with this. Just let me love them. It took me a long time to get there because my first immediate response when I first got into ministry or even began to live gospel, I was a real mean guy. Y'all don't even know. My wife used to have to walk behind me. I was that kind of a jerk. Very angry. Very mean. Very... You would not know. But I've learned... <laughs> the more I give up my rights right and thank him for every part of the journey the stronger I get to live love out loud like I wouldn't even think I don't even like when I out walk her now I'm like I'll wait for you you know why God changes hearts 
through the journey, not at the end. So at the end we give him praise. But it's even better if you can praise him when you're going through it, amen? I don't know what you're going through, but I know he loves you. And I know he wants to fix it, but you've got to decide to chase him, amen? Make up your mind. Look at your neighbor. We're doing it again. Tell him I'm making up my mind. I'm going to chase Jesus. I hope that's the fact. I don't want you to miss this series, so you need to come every Sunday for the next four weeks. Sunday morning, Sunday night, we're doing a teaching on the Holy Spirit. We're putting back into perspective what it's supposed to look like. We're not handling snakes. That's stupid. We're not talking about the perverted idea of Pentecost. We're talking about the biblical truth behind it. Come, join. Because see, that'll help you also get through whatever you're going through. You know, the most, the most times I get in trouble is when I, when I do nothing with my time. Uh, you've got men's group we've got women's group we've got thursday night group we have wednesday bible study we got sunday night bible study we got all kinds of stuff plug in so you can get out of your misery and into his grace amen, amen. that's all i got to say about that i'm going to pray for you i'm just going to pray a blessing over you i'm afraid to challenge you you guys have heard the gospel today but it's going to be up to you to use it i don't feel like i'm supposed to lay hands and pray on anybody or i think that you are our are going to have to do some of the running yourself. I'm going to pray for you. And then we're going to baptize four amazing people. And I'm going to ask them to come and sit in these chairs over here um, um, after we pray. But how many of you guys are kind of challenged to kind of look at your fight from a different perspective today? I want you to go home and start praising God for the fight and see what he does with it. It'll change your thinking, man. You're not alone. None of you are. And we're not perfect. Don't look at the man of God. Look at the God of the man because I will mess you up. Trust that God brought you here to hear a word and use that word. Amen. Would you stand? Let me pray for you. All of you. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this body. And I thank you for everything you're doing in their lives. Now I come to you now totally, totally on their behalf asking that you begin to awaken that sleeper inside of them. That every person that has given their life to you, Lord, that you would begin to fan into flames a revival in their spirit. A craving that cannot be satisfied for more of you, God. I don't want a hunger that can be satisfied. I want a craving that can never be satisfied, leaving them always wanting more and more of you, Lord. I pray that you give us the courage and the boldness to praise you through our storms today, to praise you through the pain, to praise you through, through all the things that we're going through so that, God, people see you while we're going through it. And when we bring us out on the other end, I pray, God, you ready us for the yes, you ready us for the no, ready us for whatever your will is in this situation. I pray, God, that we would not be looking for the blessings of God, but we would be looking to know the God of the blessings in such a personal way that we know we're not alone in this. Touch your people in this house. Let this word be so deeply planted in their hearts that it begins to be how they walk and live their life. I pray that I've encouraged them with your word and that you have imparted into them such a significant word today that they leave here knowing that they can be better for you today. We thank you for this, and we give you all praise and glory and honor in advance for what you're doing, not just in Vineyard of Hope, but in every church body here in Osawatomie in Miami County. We give you all glory and honor for saved lives, for hearts turned towards you. We give you praise and honor for that. Now, with every eye closed and every, every just bow your heads, please, in reverence for those that may not want their business out there, but I'm going to ask, if you don't know Jesus or you've just been running from him and you want to give your life to him, we're not going to have you come up or nothing, but I want you to raise your hand because I want to, I, want to, I want to pray with you to give your life to Jesus today. And I wish that in doing this, I could say that it's going to be easier and fluffy walking on, two loves and all. No, it's not about that. In giving your life to him, you're recognizing that you can't do it alone and that you and him together can do great things. So if you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ and you want to do that today and you just want to commit your life to him, raise your hand so I can see who I'm praying for. Wow. God is so good well, I want you guys to all pray with me dear Jesus forgive me of my sins and come into my heart I want to give you every part of me so that you can renew and restore and bring new life to this person forgive me of all I am and make me what you want me to be I commit my life to you and I make you my Lord and my Savior. 
Now I'm going to pray for you, Heavenly Father. I thank you for these five people that I saw. And I thank you that they are now, all of heaven, the Bible says, is rejoicing because five people gave their life to you. If it was one, you are rejoicing with us right now in heaven because Jesus, we have committed to you to live for you the best we know how today and better tomorrow and every day after. So I pray that in this time, God, that every heart that has given their life to you today, that you would celebrate and you begin to come in and make your presence and your heart known to them every step of the way. As they've committed to you, I pray, God, that you continue to point them toward the cross. The freedom that comes from you is immediate. Right now, they have been washed white as snow, every sin forgiven, everything forgotten. I pray that you impart that into their mind and give them the wisdom to understand this is their new beginning. We give you praise for that today. Everything washed white as snow because of the blood of Jesus Christ. I pray that they would hear and know that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The old has passed away. Behold, all things become new because they accepted you today. I thank you for that. We give you all praise and honor. And I pray, God, that you touch them. Give them, give them your heart this week. Show them, show them what you are and who you are in beautiful ways. We ask it and we believe it in Jesus' name. I want you five people at the end of the service, if you would. Um, there are connect cards on the way out. Man, give God a hand if you want to. That's great. Yeah. Five people. That's crazy. On the way out, there's some connect cards. I would like you to write down on those connect cards who you are and let me connect with you. I'm not going to get any business. I just want to, I want to, I want you to know we're there for you. But I can only be there for you at the capacity that you invite me in.